Amen. So we're there in Proverbs chapter 3. And, you know, I wanted to preach a sermon tonight called The Cost of Disobedience. The Cost of Disobedience. And what's great about the Bible, and I know I've kind of mentioned this before in another sermon, is that, I mean, the Bible has so many just profound truths in it, so many uh, things in it that just amaze us. I mean, the prophecy and, and, and just all the miracles that are in it. It's just a profound book, but it also is such a practical book. It's a book that really uh, can get down to the nuts and bolts of life and really teach us how we ought to live our life. Um, it gives us a pattern on how to live. And really, you know, if we follow the pattern that the Bible lays out for us to live, it, it benefits us. If you look there in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now those are all great things. Uh, length of days and long life and peace. Those are all things that any normal human being would desire. Anyone that has any sense would desire to live a long, peaceful life. And that's what the Bible here is saying it can give you. That if you will not forget its law and if your heart will keep its commandments, that that's exactly what you'll have. You'll have a long, you'll have length of days, you'll have long life, and you will have peace. These things will be added to you. Which, you know, tells us just logically that if you forget His law, and if you refuse to keep His commandments, that you won't have those things. That you will, uh, you, basically this, that ignoring God's Word comes at a price. It's not that we just get to ignore God's Word and nothing happens. You know, maybe we don't live a blessed life. You know, you're actually going to lose out on a lot of things when we uh, refuse to follow the pattern that God gives us. We will uh, suffer the cost of that disobedience. So, again, God's Word is just very practical. And it teaches us how to conduct our life. And it teaches us how to conduct our life in all areas of life. I mean, I challenge you to think of an area of your life that the Bible does not address. Some role that you play in life. Uh, whatever it might be that the Bible does not specifically address. You'd be hard-pressed to find it. In fact, I don't know that there is one. I mean, it, it, in every stage of life that we're in, the Bible addresses it. If you would, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6 and, and keep something in Proverbs. I'm sorry if you've already turned, but keep something in Proverbs 3. And get over to Ephesians 6, and you probably want to keep a finger in Ephesians 6 for a little, a little while. Because we're going to go back and forth between Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3 for a little bit here. But God's Word is very practical. It's something that... Uh, we can learn a great deal about every area of life that we go through. As, you know, even as beginning with uh, children, even when we're going through life as a child. Look here in Ephesians 6, verse 1. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, what I really like about that verse is that it's addressed to children. I mean, I often will remind my children of that, that the Bible is written to you, even to children. Uh, Paul said that his epistles were to be read in all the church. So if they're to be read in all the church and he's addressing the children directly, that means the children have to be with them in the church. You know, and this is kind of a side note, but that's why we're family integrated. I believe the Bible teaches a family integrated church. But he says there are children, obey your parents. So we see that the Bible is so practical, in fact, that it'll even address children. <clears throat> children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, uh, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou, uh, that thou may livest long on the earth. So again, a promise from God that if you will not forget His law, but if your heart will keep His commandments, and if you'll do the things that He commands you, such as honoring your parents, that you will have a long life on the earth. You know, you want to live a long, uh, happy, healthy life, you know, it's going to take more than just diet and exercise. You know, you're actually going to have to obey uh, and keep the commandments of God. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Again, keep something in Ephesians, but go over to Colossians chapter 3. Where again, the Bible just addresses every area of life that you can think of. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. You know, that's, that's good advice for children. You say, well, why should I obey my parents? I don't like their rules. Well, because it's well-pleasing unto the Lord. You know, that maybe it might not just be to please your, 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 for your own benefit. Maybe that's not enough to motivate you to obey your parents. You know, maybe uh, making them happy isn't enough uh, in order for uh, to, to motivate you to obey your parents. But it says right there that if you will obey your parents in all things, that it is well-pleasing unto God, unto the Lord. So that's a really strong motivation for children to obey and honor their parents. So again, that's just one area of life 
that the Bible addresses directly in such a practical manner for us uh, in, all, in all areas. It also addresses the parents as well. You're there in Colossians. Look at verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. You know, what's that talking about? I believe that's talking about having unreasonable expectations for your children. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any standards or goals or have a, a bar that we hold for our children of, kind of, of acceptable and unacceptable behavior. But we should also be reasonable about it. We should also, as parents, make sure that we're not going overboard with it and provoking them to anger, putting it out there to almost this unattainable goal of perfection for our children where they'll never attain unto it and we'll always be disappointed in them and thereby provoke them to anger and, and, and discourage them. So the Bible even addresses parents, addresses children. You're there in Ephesians, look at chapter 6, verse 4. And he fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. I and mean, it's repeating these same commands over and over. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, there is a way to raise your children. It's in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Teaching the, uh, the Bible, teaching them who God is, teaching them what God expects of us, how to live pleasing unto the Lord, and all of that that comes with it. It's really not the focus of the sermon. But it's just showing us again that the Bible is addressing us as children. It addresses us as parents. And not only that, it addresses us as even as spouses, as married people. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit unto your own husbands. Uh-oh. That's not a popular message today, is it? Well, that gets you run out of some churches. Just to get up and suggest that a, that a wife should obey her husband. That she should submit unto her own husband. As unto the Lord. I mean, that's that's not a that's not a light statement. That's not just you know however you see fit, obey your parent, uh, obey your husband, submit to your husband. No, as you would unto God, as you would unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. How submitted to, should a wife be to her husband, as much as the church is unto Christ? I mean, that's there's no compromise there. That is that is. Uh, you know, a very strong degree of submission. Amen. I mean, how, how submitted should we as a church be to the, to the Word of God? I say in every area. You know, there's no area that we should say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but we're going to take a little bit of, uh, you know, leeway here. We're going to have a little bit of elbow room. <clears throat> no, that the Bible is saying that's how submitted a wife should be to her husband. It says, that, I'll read to you from Colossians chapter 3, where it says, Wives, submit unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And it addresses the husbands as well. It says in verse 19, Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. So again, the Bible is addressing us as children. The Bible is addressing us as parents. The Bible is addressing and commanding and directing us as spouses, as husbands, as wives, and even as employees, even as, as people who would work for another individual. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Servants, be obedient unto, uh, to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. I mean, the Bible is thinking that, that we should go and have such a fear of our own employers that it would be with fear and trembling and singleness of heart. I mean, that, I, do we do that when we go to work? I mean, that's what the Bible is telling us to do. But today, you'll have a lot of employees that go back and just blow off their mouth and just talk back to the boss or, or lie to the boss and not submit to the boss. You know, that's a good way to get fired. That's a good way to not succeed as an employee. And there's a lot that we could talk about there. I mean, that, that, that's, that's really a message that needs to be preached in and of itself. It goes on in verse 6 and says, Now with eye service as men pleasers, you know, not just when the boss is looking, not just when you know he's going to notice and make him happy, but at all times, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. You know, you got a bad boss, you got a boss that you don't like, well, just remember that you should be doing it unto the Lord anyway. And, you know, the Lord will reward you. The, the Bible says there in all, in all labor there is profit. I don't care how crummy your job is, I don't care how a dead end job, of a job it is, if you will do it as unto the Lord, you will profit. You know, maybe not monetarily, maybe your, you know, your, your, uh, your billfold isn't going to swell working, you know, some, some dead end job. But I guarantee you that if you work on the Lord, you will learn lessons in that job that will help you down the road and will make you a better employee. Look at verse 8. It says, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. It addresses uh, servants again in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. 
Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. It's the same commandment again. But in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So again, another area. I mean, these are the major areas of life. I mean, maybe you could say, well, the Bible doesn't address me as this specific type of employee. But I mean, it's teaching you how to work no matter what your job is. I mean, I challenge you to find another area in life that the Bible does not address. Well, what about employers? The Bible addresses them too. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, for bearing threatening, knowing that your master, uh, your master also is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. You know, employers should be make sure that they're doing, they're treating their employees correctly, that they're doing uh, right by them as well. So really, you know, it addresses uh, parents, addresses children, addresses married people, addresses employees, addresses employers, and it also addresses the single person. The Bible, there's a lot of things that the Bible addresses to the single person. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible would tell the single person to flee fornication. I mean, if there's one message that comes up over and over again to the single person, it's to flee fornication. Right? And to stay away from it because it can become such a strong temptation. It becomes such a strong desire for a person who is single. The Bible says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now the Bible is saying that it's better to get married, that you should have your own wife and you should have your own husband, respectively. But until that time comes, the Bible does a very clear command here that it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And, and you know, what does that mean exactly? I believe that means that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And it says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Now, I believe when it's saying not to touch a woman, it literally means not to touch them. I mean, that literal. They say, well, no, it's alluding to fornication, maybe. Does the Bible really need to tell us it's not good to not fornicate? No. And the, I mean, is that what it means there by touch? Because the Bible says, up, you know, condemns fornication. So we really don't, uh, you know, throughout the pages of Scripture, we don't have to sit here and wonder what it means when it says it's good for a man not to fornicate. Well, of course, we already know that. The Bible is very clear here by saying it is good not to touch a woman. You know, and there's some, you know, people have different interpretation. That's my opinion. That's what I believe about this passage. You know, and that's why I didn't touch my wife until the night we got married. Amen. And it was a thrill. Let me tell you, I got married, you know, and we had our first kiss at the altar, and we walked out to the car, and I remember just holding her hand Amen. in the car. And I'm thinking, wow, what a thrill. You know, you go, well, that's, that's kind of weird. That's kind of, you're some kind of old fuddy-duddy. Well, you know what? That was, I enjoyed it. Amen. I thought that was great. Amen. You know, I didn't have to uh, have this great overblown uh, wedding just so I could feel special because we've been had our hands all over each other for years. You know, and I know, understand that people didn't always grow up understanding this, that people, unfortunately, uh, you know, didn't have this teaching always in their life and maybe have made that mistake. But I'm telling you what, from the standard that I have for, for my children, I want them to experience that same thrill that we had, and they're going to uh, be pure on their wedding day. That is my goal. All right. And part of that, making sure that my son goes to the altar just as pure as my daughter's, is I'm going to teach him, it is good not to touch a woman Amen. until you get married. <clears throat> and you know, this is something I think that needs to be preached because lately I've seen a lot of unmarried people or you know people who are engaged or a girlfriend, and, and you would think they were married. You would think they were married by the way they just have their hands all over each other. You know, and I understand, again, my opinion. This is what I think. This is how I feel about it. But since we're on the subject, I'm going to tell you how I feel about Amen. it. When people are coming in, even into God's house, and into God's church, just hands all over each other. And you'd say, are they, are they married? Because they sure look like it. The way, you know, and, I, and you look around, you don't even see married couple holding, getting, groping each other like some people are. You know, I understand you're excited about getting married, but can you just keep your hands to yourselves for a little bit longer? At least in the in a, in a house of God when you're in front of other people's children. Uh, you know, I don't think that's too much to ask, that people would keep their hands to themselves. It, it just makes you wonder. If you're willing to do that in front of God and everybody else, right. to just sit there and have your hands all over each other, what are you doing when nobody's looking? Right. You know, that, that's what makes me think, makes me wonder. And the Bible says that we should avoid the mere appearance of evil. So, because here's the thing, you know, think, well, it's just touching. What's wrong with a little, a little touching? Because it leads to other things. 
you know, any married couple knows that that's where things start. You know, it, that, that's where things build up. And, you know, once you start that physical desire for somebody, once you have that physical uh, relationship building with somebody like that, I'll tell you something, it'll blind you to a lot of qualities. It will absolutely blind you to a person's bad qualities. Go uh, over to Romans, or excuse me, Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? I mean, that's how practical God, uh, of a matter, uh, just a matter of fact that God wants you to understand this, this, this topic of fooling around. I mean, you would say, oh, I can get away with it. It's not going to affect me. Really? Can you take fire in your bosom and your clothes not be burned? Mm -hmm. We all know the answer to that. The answer is no. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? <clears throat> So here's the thing, when people say, well, you know, people, it's okay if they're, you know, they, they touch and things like that. They got to get to know each other and get comfortable with one another. But here's the thing about that, is that married people, they have decades to get comfortable with one another. I mean, you're not going to have any trouble getting comfortable with one another Man. when you have a whole life ahead of you of being able to get comfortable with one another in that way. So I just think it's best to just take the Bible for what it says right there in that passage. And this is addressing singles. Again, the, the point of the sermon is that the Bible addresses us in every area of life. Yeah. And it addresses the singles in this regard. That it is good for them not to touch each other. For a man not to touch a woman. <clears throat> you know, and you know, I'm, I'm just kind of going off on this a little bit because it's kind of been bothering me a little bit. And here's the thing. I, I, I've heard, you know, the world would look at us, someone who would say, you know, you shouldn't touch a woman. You shouldn't even touch her. You shouldn't have any kind of physical relationship with her until you get married. And I, I had that when I was working out in the in the secular world. And I would tell guys that they would ask that, if, you know, do you have a girlfriend or this or that? And I would tell them where I stand on that issue. And boy, they they would just mock you. They would just have fun with that. And here's one thing they always like to say. And this is the dumbest thing. Well, I'm going to try the milk before I buy the cow. First of all, I don't think a woman would really appreciate you, you know, compare, making that comparison. Right. But, you know, men aren't always the brightest, right? When they make, when, especially when they get into these carnal subjects. Well, I'm going to try the milk before I buy the cow. Well, here's the thing about that, buddy. It's all milk at the end of the day. You know, right. it, it's all milk. So you don't need to try the milk before you buy the cow. Right. You know, this kind of mentality that's out there. So, you know, again, the, the point of the sermon is that the Bible is addressing us in every area of life. It's addressing us as children. It's addressing us as parents. It's addressing us as married people. It's addressing us as employees, employers, as single people. And, you know, the point of this is, is that if you ignore the guidelines that the Bible gives, no matter what area of life it is, if you say, I know, I know better than God, or that's not going to apply to me, or I don't need to, to, to give heed to that, it's going to come, that's disobedience, and it's going to come at a cost. It's going to cost you. There will be a cost to your disobedience. Ignoring these guidelines comes with consequences. You know, go ask, go ask any, uh, you know, any teenage girl who got knocked up, who didn't want to, you know, have anything to do with this. Go ask the guy who's paying child support uh, to some kid he never sees. That it comes with consequences. Go ask the guy who can't hold down a job. That it, you know, ignoring God's word, uh, asking whether or not there's consequences to ignoring God's word. There's consequences to ignoring God's word. Amen. Go ask the parent whose heart's broken because they didn't raise their Lord or their child in the, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ask them if there's consequences to not obeying God's word. All right. There's consequences, and that's we've got to get this through our head. Amen. We're not just going to get away with it. <clears throat> And a lot of times, the consequences often they cannot be reversed. Once you there's certain mistakes that once you make in life, you're going to live with them for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's best to just not make those mistakes. It's best to take heed and understand what the Bible says and avoid making those mistakes because those mistakes come with consequences that cannot be reversed. Amen. You're there in Proverbs. Turn over to Proverbs chapter five. <clears throat> Children who 
disregard instruction, there are going to be consequences to people, the children especially, if they disregard the instruction that they're being taught. It says here in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 7, Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh at the door of her house, lest you give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. So here's an individual who hated uh, instruction, who despised reproof. And it goes on and says, And have not obeyed the voice of my teacher, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. There's this person who's bemoaning and bewailing their position in life. Because they hated the instruction that they had, that, that they refused. They hated the instruction, they despised the reproof, and now they're suffering the consequences. And what is the consequences here? Thy flesh and thy body are consumed. He's talking about in the beginning there, uh, thy years being, uh, 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 and thy years unto the cruel, thy honor unto others, strangers being filled with thy wealth, and thy labor, you know, going into severe debt, you know, you know, going into, you know, getting involved in gambling or something like that, or some. Uh, getting into some drug habit that's just going to consume all of your money. You know, becoming an alcoholic, becoming a drug addict where you're just spending all of your money and, 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 you're, and you're spending it and all your wealth is being given unto the, unto the cruel. Yeah. <clears throat> your flesh being consumed. Whenever I read that, I think about some person who's just getting racked with disease. Going out there and just sleeping around, hating the reproof, hating the instruction that it should be one man, one woman for life, and, 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 and not having that relationship until marriage and going around just sleeping around and catching some STD. And you don't think that happens. People just think, well, it's never going to be happening to me. There's been people in this church that's happened to. Wow. They came in there and they slept around one time with one girl and got HIV. Wow. They've been here. I've known people like that. <clears throat> and it's a tragedy, people. Yeah. To have that happen to you at 15, 16 years right. old. Because, and why does it happen? Because you know better than God. Uh -huh. Because you hate instruction. Because you think you know better. And those kind of consequences last a lifetime. Right. And you will never, ever be able to reverse it. I mean, think about all the STDs out there that are in, uncur incurable. They cannot be cured. Yeah. Some of them can be suppressed. And then let's say you contract some STD by sleeping around with somebody. And then you decide that you're going to get your heart right with God. And now you, you meet some godly person that you want to marry. Right. You think you're going to be able to go into marriage and not tell them about that? Right. And have to tell them something like that, that could very well change their mind about marrying you. Right. And I wouldn't blame them. <clears throat> They're incurable. What about all the, the, ch the, the fatherless children that are out there? That They're there to stay. They're going to have a hard time coming up. What about all the, the divorced people? You know, that, that are, are, divorced people are rarely reconciled. It doesn't happen very often. It's a very rare thing. I've seen it one time. You know, in all the in all the years that I the all the years the few years I to phrase that you know the, the 38 years that I've been around I've seen that happen one time you know maybe it's happened more than 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 I'm aware of but uh, you know and I'm sure it has but that's not that's not normally what happens people get bitter they get angry and you know good luck getting them back together you know wayward children who wander out of the way because we didn't instruct them as parents because we didn't take heed to God's word and teach them these things. And they go astray and they go to the devil. They very rarely return and come back. They often go you know, to the far extreme of the world. You know, we can even apply this to entire ministries. Ministries that, you know, start ignoring the word of God, ignoring the commands of God, putting off the, the, the first works, the soul winning, getting into some other worldly program. And eventually those ministries break. You know, a lot of ministries that are, are broken, that ignore God, that, that despise His instructions and how a church ought to be run, they eventually break. They, they are often not repaired. You know, a lot of times when these things happen, it's for good, it's for life, it's permanent. There is no coming back from it. Because here's the thing, you know, one, one thing I've noticed is, is that people have this mentality. People get themselves in a bind. People get themselves in a tough position in life, and then they're calling the church. Then they're leaving the voicemail. Then they're reaching out to a man of God and asking, what do I do? Help me. As if we have some magic wand. As if the Bible is just some, something we're just going to hold over your head and swirl around and say abracadabra and just fix your life. 
It doesn't work like that. The Bible is not a magic wand to fix your life. The Bible is a uh, is, is 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 a prevent a booklet of preventative maintenance. If I can say that. It's to avoid those problems to begin with. Man. Because those problems are, are permanent. Yeah. Those the results of the uh, of the sin that comes are permanent. God's word is not a magic wand. If you would turn over to Galatians chapter six. Galatians chapter six. I'll be getting uh, reading in verse seven where the Bible reads, "Be not deceived; God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap." For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's a guarantee. Yep. That's a guarantee. It's not a maybe. Nice. If you sow to your flesh, you're going to reap of the flesh. But, you know, that law can work for you as well. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You can't go out and sow all your wild oats and then and then not experience that harvest. You, you're going to have that. You will reap what you sow. Now, that can be very discouraging to people who've been sowing a lot of bad seed, couldn't it? If you've been sowing a lot of bad seed in your life to find out that you're going to reap what you sow, right. that it's just God's law, I mean, it's as sure as gravity that you are going to reap that harvest, you know, we might find ourselves in a position in life where we say, that, that sounds rough. And it, you know what? Honestly, it is rough. Mm -hmm. yep. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to reap, you know, start, uh, you know, but here's the thing. If that harvest comes to an end, you know, if you stop sowing to the flesh, eventually that all those seeds they, they sprout, they grow, the harvest comes, we deal with it, and then we can move on. <clears throat> In the meantime, what we need to be doing is sowing good seed. You know, I, I remember hearing a pastor or a preacher talk about this years ago, and he was from the south somewhere. I, I'm not sure exactly where, but I guess in the south your lawn is a big deal. You know, right. The type of grass that you have is a real big deal. And I'm not, I don't know the different types of grasses that are out there. You know, you got your Kentucky bluegrass and some of that. That's like the only one I know. <laughs> you got that one. You know, in Michigan we had crabgrass. Yep. I don't know if that's a desirable one or not. <laughs> no. Pretty sure it isn't, right? We had all these different types of grass. You always fight the weeds and things like that. But I guess like the pet, like the one that they really like is, if I got the name right, uh, Joysia. Is that right? Anyone have heard of that? Joysia grass? No? I know you guys spent some time in Tennessee. Anyway, people, this is the type of grass to have. And if you want to have that grass, you know, basically what you do is you would plant just a little bit of it and it would take over. And it would eventually push this type of grass, and it was very desirable, would push and kill all the other grass. <clears throat> and really, that's how we have to start looking at life. It's saying, you know, I want to start planting some good seed that's going to spread and take over. And if you would just start doing that in your life, start planting that good seed in your life, you know, start listening to the preaching of the Word of God, reading the Bible for yourself, and start applying it to your life and planting a little bit of a patch here and a patch here and a patch here, what you would find is that eventually they would spread out into the rest of your life. Amen. And, you know, it would push out all the bad things in your life, all the bad seeds that you sow and all that bad grass that is that you're having to uh, harvest in your life. You know, it's just an analogy to, to show us how we ought to live our life. Right. That we need to start planting good seed if we expect to have, you know, a nice the nice lawn of life. You want the nice lawn of life? You gotta start planting the right kind of grass and give it time and let it grow. <laughs> because again, God's not just gonna fix things for you overnight. You know, you can't just call uh, the church and start you know, whining about the fact that you had a bad marriage and now you're, you know, you called the cops on your husband and he's doing 20 years and you wish you could take him back. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? He's in the hands of the county now. And they're not, they're not nice about it. They've got him locked up. They're going to keep him there. You don't think that type of thing happens? I've gotten those calls. Mm -hmm. Oh, this and that. Oh, I just, I feel so bad. I called the cops on my husband. And I just feel terrible. And now he's doing 20 years. Because you had, a, you guys had a spat. Because you had a fight, and got got it in your head that you were going to call the cops. That type of thing happens. <clears throat> people, people uh, get married to the wrong folks, and and, and life can just be very difficult. <clears throat> so you know, 
God doesn't have a magic wand, but here's the thing. You can learn to cope with the effects of sin. Sin will have an effect on your life that maybe will never go away, and we can learn to cope with it. And we can always move on and continue to serve God no matter what our circumstances are or whatever the difficulty is, there's still hope for us to serve God. But we have to understand that you know it's not always going to be the ideal. And really the point of the message is not necessarily to, to beat up those that have made those mistakes, but it's to help those that haven't made those mistakes, to not make those mistakes. Because you, if you make those mistakes, those things that come, the results are permanent. And they cannot uh, just go, they won't just go away. You can't wish them away. And it doesn't matter how sorry you are. You know, you make a mistake in life, you mess up, it doesn't matter how sorry you are. That, you know, the, the time to, to, to seek God and, and, and His will and His blessing is before you make those mistakes. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, For godly sor sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You know, it's good to be sorry for the things that we've done. We have to understand something. That's not necessarily just going to make it all go away. Yep. We're still going to have to deal with the consequences. And God will give mercy, and God will give grace, and God will help us. But that doesn't mean that all of that. That doesn't mean the consequences of our sin isn't going to be dealt with for the rest of our life. Again, God's word is, isn't a magic wand, and people need to get this through their heads that they can't just live however they want, make all the mistakes that they want to make. And then when they decide, when they feel like they've had enough of the world, to come back to God and expect Him to just fix it all. And just drop everything and, 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 and fix your life back up because you're, you know, you're tired of, of the way things are turning out. That's not how it works with God. That's not how it works with the Bible. The Bible is a book of preventative maintenance. It's something that we should be teaching our children early on in life and warning them and instructing them so they don't make those mistakes to begin with. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 17, Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing that thou keep them within thee. They shall with all be fitted in thy lips, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee, have I not written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge? I mean, we, have, we already have the book. We already have the guidebook to life. We already have uh, the way, the, the instructions that are going to help us not to have to pay the consequences of disobedience. We're not moving through this life blind. Thy word is a light and a lamp unto my feet. Amen. And God has given us a light, and we need to take heed unto it as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, because the world is a dark place. And we have the light. So there's no excuse to just say, well, I didn't know. You know, especially if you're sitting in a church where the Bible is actually being preached and taught. And you have the, the Bible in your hands and the Holy Spirit in your heart. There's no excuse for it. You have, the, you have it right here. Have I not written unto thee? These things are already written. The counsel is already there. The time to take heed of that counsel is now. Not after the fact. Not after the, you know, the consequences of disobedience have come upon you. You need to be preventative. You know, if we give heed to these warnings, we're going to spare ourselves a lot of unnecessary suffering. I mean, people go through a lot of suffering that they never had to go through if they had just given heed to what this book says. Yeah. And granted, I know a lot of people come up, they don't know what the book says. No one ever teaches them, and they just go in the way of the world. And that's unfortunate. But that's not us. Man. And that's not the young people in this room. That's not you. Those of you that have not made that mistake, you don't have that excuse. Right. You know, you, you have the warnings all right here. You have all the counsel right there. And, and don't think that, well, you can just put it off for as long as you want and go out and live however you want. And then when you feel like it's time to come back to God, He's just going to make everything okay. That's not how it works. We make mistakes out there. The consequences that come are permanent. They will not just go away. But it, here's the thing, you don't ever have to go down that path. You don't ever have to experience any of that suffering if you'll just give heed to the warnings today. But make no mistake about it. If you want to ignore the commands of God, just be prepared to pay the price, the cost of your disobedience. Let's go ahead and pray.